Of all my keyboards, this is the best looking one. This is the Rama M60A, or my favorite keyboard design of 2018 and 2019 so far. Before we get started, a disclaimer since the second round is running as a publishing. I paid full price for this, I have not had any contact with Rama about the video, and I very much doubt that they knew of me when shipping it out. I should mention the packaging since it is pretty special. It's been a while since I opened this, so I'm not really sure how it was all packed, but here are some of the included things. The outer box has the Rama logo, which is pretty cool. Inside, there's a ton of foam. Some of the extra components, like the internal weight, were embedded within here. And we get to the main box, which has a lot of this holographic print on it. I think this does look pretty good, but I'm not a big fan of this Japanese text on an Australian keyboard. There's quite a bit of detail work here. When you take the top off, the bottom has some print in the inner portions, not to mention the cute XO pattern tape. The PCB came in a separate plastic box in a branded anti-static bag. The cable and the other accessories were packed in these EXO branded Ziploc bags, which are really nice. It also comes with an Allen wrench as well as a cleaning cloth. The included cable feels fairly high quality. It's braided and has metal ends, which just feel great. The unboxing experience is distinguished from others, and this level of attention to detail surely adds up in cost. As a point of comparison, my E6 V2 also shipped in a more premium than usual packaging. We can see some of the same holographic printing and the same black inner foam material. There were gloves included for handling unfinished brass surfaces. I'd say this is about the same quality as Rama, but with a different aesthetic. As the custom keyboards market matures, legitimizing your product in more traditional ways like packaging seems to be on some designers' minds. If you hang around in the community even a little bit, you've probably seen this everywhere. I think it sold a good number during the group buy, and it's also been used extensively in renders for various key sets. The reason for this is that this is just the most perfect, beautiful, properly proportioned input device that I and many others have ever seen. Looking straight down, the two symmetrical blockers are very evident. This is complemented by the relatively thick forehead, which is in turn contrasted by these thin side bezels. I vastly prefer a standard 60% layout without blockers for usability, but I don't think that would have had the same effect here. The top was designed with blockers in mind. To understand what I mean here, take a look at the Aquaria V1. Of course, this isn't perfectly comparable, but it has a similar design without the blockers, and I think it doesn't look that great. Tilting our angle a little bit, we can see that this top surface is sharply cornered with the sides. There is just a tiny bit of chamfer around the edge, but I think that was just to reduce the chance of damage to a fragile thin element. The front edge is perpendicular to the resting surface and is fairly tall, adding to its imposing look. The sides are a truncated wedge shape, and you can see that the corners are gently rounded. From here, we start to get a peek of the most impressive design element of the keyboard, the rear weight. This is a piece of polished PVD coated brass that gives just enough flair to the otherwise understated design. In the center is the USB Type-C cutout as well as branding. It's a shame that this isn't really visible during everyday use, but getting glimpses of it from the side is something I enjoy. The port here is on a daughter board that sits flush to the bottom case. This was to allow the cable to be parallel to the resting surface when plugged in. I have mixed feelings about this. On the one hand, if the cable sat perpendicular to the back edge, it would have looked wonky, but on the other, this sort of disrupts the fluid design. But I guess you don't really get to see that all too often. The M60A only supports the MXHHAB layout. This is basically as symmetrical as you can get with a standard stagger, and it contributes to the overall look. This is especially noticeable when you have keycaps with different colored alphas and modifiers. The modifiers make a V up the side, which then draw your eyes up to the forehead. I can't confirm whether this was a conscious decision, but it surely worked out great. I really can't praise the design of this keyboard enough. I hope to see more like this in the future. We saw some elements adopted in the Koyu, but it wasn't quite it. But I don't know anything about design, so I'll let Rama figure it out. To take the board apart, just undo the four screws on the bottom. I like to then lay the whole thing flat and lift off the top, then rest that upright while undoing one end of the cable. You can see that the USB daughter board is screwed onto the bottom, which is a fairly lightweight part. From the bottom of the top case, we can see the PCB. This is attached to the top with just four screws on the left and right sides. Towards the bottom, there is some branding with Japanese. Rama seems to like putting Japanese on stuff, so that's whatever. Google Translate says that this top text is Experience Design, the one under 60% is Electronics, the one under M60 says Release, so that's saying this is the A release of the M60, and finally the bottom right text is Rama, Kate, Dad, so I guess Credits. The rear weight and accent is held on by these four screws internally. You can see that there are machining marks on some of the interior facing sides, but the exterior is absolutely flawless. I love it. 
Without that rear piece, this keyboard is super light. As a matter of fact, in this state, it is one of the lightest keyboards I own and you can sort of see why. In this ongoing second round, an aluminum accent with some phosphor-filled enamel detail, aka glow-in-the-dark resin, is offered so you can expect a much lighter keyboard with that. Also with the rear weight removed, you can get a good look into the case when the top and the bottom are attached. You can see that there's quite a bit of space in there. I'll get into this more later, but that contributes to the sound. The bottom weight, if you have one, attaches with just these three screws. Shipped to the US, this cost me about $500, and at that price you would rightly expect superb build quality. The anodizing was perfect, and all of the brass finish is great. I did find one issue though, the bottom piece is held onto the top with 4 screws, and if you tap on it from anywhere in the center, you'll hear a clack. This comes from the bottom and top not making flush contact at every possible point. It doesn't change the sound of the board at all, but you do hear that rattle when you set it down. If it bothers you a lot, I'm sure you can do the old stick electrical tape until it stops rattling trick, but since it's not an issue during use, I won't. The biggest gripe I have with this board in terms of build is how the plate was handled. A big selling feature was that 5mm integrated plate with additional cuts made to support switches clipping in. The other important feature was hot swap capability, whose implementation success depends on the collaboration between the plate and the PCB. I think here, it wasn't done perfectly, but I can sort of sympathize with the other side, assuming all manufacturing choices were intentional. The first point is just how loose the cutouts are. If you look at something like the K-Type, you'll see very tight plates that make up for some of the lost rigidity coming from hot swap switches with no PCB mount legs. If you plug a switch in, you can rotate it all about, and if that switch doesn't have PCB mount legs, it'll often end up crooked, ruining the look of this gorgeous design. This can sort of be a good thing in that kill hot swap sockets aren't all that robust and have the potential to be damaged when using too much force. If the pins are all aligned properly, it's no problem, but if they're not, you can apply undue stress to either the PCB or the socket when you finally get the switch to clip in. This problem is similar in spirit to how it can be difficult to prevent bottoming out on super tactile switches. The looser cutout actually lets you wiggle a switch in, which is much safer for your PCB. While we're on the topic of the cutouts, each one has these weird vertical nibs in the corners. These are probably here to clear switch corners better. Some plates, like the one on the KBD661, shaved bits of plastic from the corners of certain switches. Moving on, the PCB is also not perfect. It has in-switch RGB, which is nice to have, even if I'll never use it, I guess. And the VIA configurator launched with this board, which is basically a bootmapper client that's not stuck in early 2000s UI. But my complaint is with the PCB mount holes. In most custom keyboard PCBs, there are two holes adjacent to the center hole that accepts PCB mount legs and 5-pin switches. These pegs are used for alignment and would have been really beneficial in this loosey-goosey plate, but that opportunity is ruined by them being too wide. Before the redesign, Zilios and other gate round switches had thicker than usual PCB mount legs. This meant that you had to sort of force the switches in while holding both the plate and the PCB. But even these fit loosely in the M60's PCB. In fact, I can wiggle in a 5-pin Zilios just the same as I can do any plate mount switch. So here, the PCB mount leg holes do little more than rough alignment. This combined with the loose plate means that regardless of your switch mounting selection, you're probably going to end up with a bunch of crooked keys on your $500 keyboard. Again, to play the devil's advocate, maybe this was to prevent user damage through excessive force, but this just seems like catering to the lowest common denominator. I think most enthusiasts who bought into the M68 can sort of figure out that sometimes you can sacrifice a bit of convenience for a better end product. I wouldn't have been very upset if I had to disassemble the board every time I swap switches. I already take greater care when pulling switches as to not damage the plate anyway. I think I actually would have preferred a soldering PCB, and good news, it's being offered in the currently running group I. I asked the designer of the PCB about the holes, and he said they will indeed be tighter, so I'll be definitely picking up one of these. I didn't ask about the hot swap version, but it seems like this will be at least a solution to the problem in the next round of M60As. These issues aside, the board is built really well. When I ordered this, I was still under the false belief that weight directly translates to quality, so I went with the optional internal brass weight. When I first got the board, I immediately installed it. When I finally removed it for review, I was shocked at how light the board is in its absence. Without it, it seems like something I can actually carry around with me. However, when doing this, the sound of the keyboard changes so drastically that I'd want to fill the cavity with some kind of dampening material. More on that later. The board does have per-key RGB, which is fairly uncommon in custom keyboards, so I guess I should show it off. 
Even with lining, the switches are facing the correct direction, so you won't have an issue with cherry profile keycaps colliding with the switch tops. However, this means that shine through keycaps won't be as effective since those legends are usually on top of the typing surface, but I doubt anybody is using those with this. The M60 is configurable with QMK, but it ships with the VIA firmware loaded. This is a nice user interface for programming your keys as well as your lighting. While it is not as full features as diving into the code, a lot of people just don't have the need, want, time, or knowledge for that, so this is a great solution. There's no putting your keyboard into bootloader mode, and you can change lighting configurations on the fly, which is very impressive. I hope to see this catch on for more boards. I think Olivia of GMK Olivia fame is working on this, so if you know how to program, consider contributing to that project. I totally would if coding was my hobby, but keyboards is. I think thick integrated plates were a trend that's come and gone at this point. Now variations on gasket mounting seems to be all the rage. Regardless, this kind of mounting style has its quirks and features. The main advantage to a thick plate is the sound. I commended my winky list, rest in peace, B-Face X2, that had a two-piece plate for superior sound, and it's sort of the case here. Obviously, it's not going to be the same since this is metal, but there is still a little bit of that per-switch isolation going on here. The other advantage is that it solves the problem with thin integrated plates. These plates, like the ones found on the new Mini and the K-Type, tend to be really pingy and annoying. Just by adding more material, we get rid of that potential for reverb. Another consequence of this plate design is the rigidity. At this thickness, especially when integrated, it is just impossible for there to be any kind of flex. This means that the bottom out feel will be super solid, maybe even more solid than in tray mount cases. There is absolutely zero give or vibrations upon the downstroke, which could be a negative for some people. It's pretty harsh, and I do prefer a more flexible or absorbent experience overall. With firmer mounting solutions, I usually like to use clicky switches, but box whites were really all over the place in terms of alignment when I tried them out. For now, the switches in these are just a mashup of what I had lying around. They're alias housings with tactile mount stems and 67 gram zeal springs. Again, this doesn't offer the most forgiving typing experience, but maybe you can use a switch with a heavier spring weight to avoid bottoming out and facing that cold slab of a plate. Rama enjoys a unique position in the community. At most times, they seem pretty detached, and once in a while there will be some new design or group I announced. Maybe this era mystery contributes to the hype around these boards, but that doesn't change the fact that they have released some very nice looking products. The other thing is that they're really good at marketing even with this sort of detached approach. All of their marketing materials are well organized and having them appear in various keyset renders is just a ton of free advertising. So with this elevated status, they are able to get away with prices that seem to me like higher than comparable customs, as well as a website that's one of the most pretentious that I've seen. Just to back myself up, shortly after the M60A shift, there was a person on Mac Market trying to sell them for $700. This was obviously a super high price, but this kind of markup is not without precedent. Anyway, the other piece of criticism the post got was for listing small components of the board like screws and feet. People gave OP a lot of crap for this, not remembering that this was just copied and pasted from Rama's site. I understand there's a difference between running a group by and flipping, but it just seems like Rama is somehow immune to a lot of criticism. That's not to say I have many points of criticism for the entity, as their communication during the group by was fairly good, and though it took quite a long time for these to ship, I was generally satisfied with what I got. I guess at the end of the day, there is value in buying from a well-respected designer. This is a weird keyboard. It looks stunning, the best, but it's got a lot of features that kind of walk the line between enthusiast and mass market. Of course, the price is a huge deterrent for the greater market, but what I'm saying is that a lot of customs at this price point intentionally don't have hot swap sockets to offer greater security. Additionally, the choice of plate is just kind of odd. The Koyu had this as well, and it looks like the upcoming TKL U80 will too, and I just don't know why Rama is so invested in this style, as it's fairly uncommon for a good reason. The harsh bottom mount is at odds with the enthusiast community, and I too would have liked to have seen something like top mount on the ongoing second round. 
Maybe this is just a consequence to that detached approach to community engagement, since it's clear that people will buy most anything from Rama. I know I sure will. However, the truth is, since arriving at my doorstep, the M60A has largely sat on a shelf. It's not a bad keyboard by any means, but the typing experience on it is just unexceptional. This had the potential to be a looker and a performer, but it's only the former. But this is clearly a design-centered keyboard, and a designer is gonna do what a designer is gonna do.